Yeah, that's me, bub. 160 years old and having my heart broken for the millionth time. How did it all go so wrong? Well, if you ask me, it all started back when I met a man named Xavier. No, not that one. The other one. In today's modern world where conversations of acceptance, tolerance, community, and laser eyes are so prominent, you'd think X-Men would be a bigger hit for touching on all of that. But as it is, X-Men is in that nebulous Ralph Boner void between projects after Disney purchased 20th Century Fox, and we're left with a dearth of X-Men content. Will they be brought back with the same cast via the multiverse in Doctor Strange 2? Will they be recast with a hot young new group of photogenic 20-somethings that have a lot of followers on the gram? Who knows? I can't keep track of what's happening anymore, so my prediction is that all the X-Men will be former employees of Tony Stark that want revenge because he called them freaks and weirdos at a party once in 2004. Seeing as how it's going to be a while before we get more X-Men on the big or possibly small screen, it might be fun to take a look back at their first successful outing as a cross-media adaptation. You'd think that it wasn't until the grounded and serious live-action take that X-Men adaptations would touch on the more grounded and serious themes but I think that the X-Men of the 90s accomplished that just as much as the movies did, and maybe a bit more, while also being full of depth and love for the source material. You know, instead of unbridled shame. But before we get too much further into all that 90s Saturday morning cartoon goodness, I got a secret to tell you. It's really important, so hear me out. Lean in, because I want you to focus on this one. There's just been something really bothering me lately. And I feel like not enough people are talking about it. There's this thing going around that maybe you've heard of. It has global PvP, massive PvE, boss battles, 600 plus champions, and it seems like no one on YouTube is talking about it. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends! If you've heard of Raid Shadow Legends, you know it's got more champions than you can shake a magic staff at. Over 600 now. But it's also got an insane level of variety for bosses, too. Let's put one of those guys in the spotlight today. The Guardian of the Void Keep, Malik Kavar. This guy was the Priest of Light at one point, but he had an epiphany while stargazing one night. Whether he was right or not, his fellow priests didn't care much for it, and they kicked him to the curb for speaking such philosophical gobbledygook. Lucky for us, he went off to master the magic art of the Void. So we have a nice supply of Void potions to ascend our champions with. Not so lucky for us, he has a nasty attitude about the whole being exiled thing so he's not giving up his potions without a fight. The main trick to fighting Malak is dealing with all the poison he puts out. It's a lot, and he has an ability that deals all the poison damage you could take all at once, which can nuke your whole team if you're not careful. His poison debuffs can't be blocked or resisted either, so you'll need shield buffs and healing to counteract the damage, or just the ability to remove the debuffs directly, and often. If you can cleanse debuffs on this boss, you'll be good to go. He doesn't have many other tools at his disposal. And the game is updated regularly, so this month there's special events every day. A bunch of awesome new champions, and the brand new huge feature Guardian Ring that gives you a load of new ways to use your champions. And at the start of December, Raid's releasing one of its biggest, most anticipated features ever. Take a look at this. It looks insane with all these new updates and an even bigger one right around the corner. Now's the perfect time to get started in Raid. If you wait any longer, you're going to get left behind. If you want to get a huge head start in Raid, all you have to do is hit the link in the description or scan my QR code and you'll get Epic Hero Chonaro, who's amazing in the Doom Tower, 200k silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill, and 1 Ancient Shard so you can summon an awesome champion as soon as you get in game. See you there, now back to the video. If you haven't seen the show, or maybe you have, take this journey with me back to the very beginning. No, 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 not that. Let's start even earlier, but we'll get to that. Whenever people talked about 90s X-Men growing up, I always imagined this. The 1989 pilot that was never picked up for a series, now dubbed Pride of the X-Men. Because this was the only older X-Men cartoon I watched as a kid. I was born in 98, so the animated series wasn't on anymore. Just reruns on channels I didn't watch, and by the time I was old enough to care about these shows, Evolution was in full swing. So, I didn't feel the need to seek out the older one. But I had a VHS tape of this. Before I get into the 90s show, I feel it's interesting to have some context with this 30-minute pilot that came a few years before. Narrated by Stan Lee, the Manly Lee. Welcome 
This is Stan Lee of Marvel Comics warning you to look around you. Your classmates, your friends, you never know which one of them may be a mutant. It's lighthearted and fast-paced and doesn't dwell on anything too heavy. It's the story of Kitty Pride being inducted into the X-Men spitefully named School for Freaks and Weirdos and helping to stop Magneto's Brotherhood of Unsubtlety from unleashing a doomsday weapon to blow up the Earth. It has a real 80s action cartoon feel. Here's the good guys, here's the bad guys. They fight. G.I. Joe and Cobra, Autobots and Decepticons, He-Man and Skeletor, normal people versus Twitter users. It's really well animated, but it's just too simple. It doesn't have the biting commentary that makes X-Men important and relevant. The themes are too surface level. It doesn't want to bog anyone down by reminding them of racism, so it's just super people punching each other. I do enjoy the look of the characters in this version, and they had a pretty decent roster for the X-Men. Somehow as a kid, I never noticed that Wolverine had this accent. Get with it! The X-Men don't have room for Warney Brat! Apparently the creators were forced to make that change because Mad Max and Crocodile Dundee were popular at the time. How you doing? Want a piece of fruit? Kids! Welcome her! Wait, she's not drawn in the X-Men, is she? She's just a kid! Wolverine! What's the matter with this bozo? An Australian playing me? That'll be that, eh? Actually, look, Hugh Jackman is also Australian. He what? They end the episode by making us think Nightcrawler heroically sacrificed himself, and Kitty laments that the eccentric comic relief teammate has given his life for a noble cause. Except this show doesn't have the stones for that, so he's fine! If anyone wants to get into the 90s X-Men show, they should see this first so they can get a feel for all the things that this show is not, and what kind of show it was expected to be at the time. Even if you're not a comic book historian, it's still a fun watch and can put the following series into more perspective. Both are good takes on the characters, but one has so much more going on under the hood worth looking at. 90s X-Men is more... about something. Pride of the X-Men is what you'd probably expect the 90s series to be, and that wouldn't be bad, but it wouldn't be that special or unique either. It'd just be more of a lot of the 80s style good guys versus bad guy cartoons we've all seen before, and those are awesome, but X-Men the Animated Series is something else. Three years after Pride of the X-Men failed to take off, but it did launch a really good arcade game where Colossus does that scream. Oh, f that shit's hilarious. Then we got X-Men the Animated Series, starring Canadian Wolverine, oh thank god. I'm so happy that we live in the universe where this became the default accent. That was a close one. Would've probably been easier on Hugh though. Instead of Kitty Pride, our point of entry into this world is Jubilee. She's a young mutant girl who feels misunderstood and is taken in by Xavier and his team so she can finally feel at home. It's a contractual obligation that every X-Men adaptation starts with a shy teenage mutant girl being taken in by the school and taught about her powers. It's a bit cliche, but it works pretty well every time. Because it's a convenient way to introduce the concept of the X-Men without doing an entire origin story for them. But in this one, we spend more time with Jubilee, seeing her feel isolated from the, her foster parents being a fish out of water in public, and almost being abducted by a giant robot allegory. We get a better sense of why life as a mutant is harder than it is for a normal person. She's alone and subject to a lot of prejudice. Even going to the mall can be dangerous when the whole world wants them dead for being themselves. In Pride of the X-Men, Shadowcat just gets to the mansion and says no one in her life knows she's a mutant. Here we get to see why that's a secret worth keeping instead of just being told. Flash forward in the episode after Jubilee has been officially recruited, and the X-Men are running a more grounded mission, destroying the factory that builds Sentinels, giant robot mutant hunters that make for great video game bosses. As their ground team assaults the compound, they're overwhelmed by enemy forces and Beast is captured alive, while Morph, the shape-shifting comic relief, is killed. I mean, it's a kid's cartoon, he can't be dead, right? It's gotta be a fake-out! He's gonna be fine by the end of the episode, cause status quo? For all we know, Morph and Beast may still be alive! Beast is... What about Morph? Morph. He's gone. I'll avenge you, my friend. I swear it. Oh. Oh, oh jeez. Yeah, he's dead, I guess. Until he's resurrected as like an evil zombie by Mr. Sinister later on because this is a comic book show. But still, the fact that they left the episode hanging on his demise and have characters still reeling over it episodes later is nuts. 
In a lot of shows from a little bit before this, like G.I. Joe or He-Man, this wouldn't be possible because mortality and grieving the loss of a friend is a mature concept for a kid's show. Transformers got away with it by just putting all of that in the PG-13 movie released in theaters. So, this was a new thing for network shows of this caliber. Even Spider-Man couldn't mention death, everyone just goes to different dimensions. What happened to Morph is a great example of one of my favorite things about this show. There are actual consequences and each episode matters. Beast is arrested and remains in jail for the entire season. We see multiple stages of his court trial for the attack on the factory. We see how his case is viewed by the politicians and the public as well as other mutants. He becomes the poster boy for the entire mutant rights movement. And as the season progresses, we check back in on his storyline multiple times. He has the opportunity to break out of his confinement after Magneto tries to spring him, and the other X-Men meet him on an unrelated jailbreak for Colossus midway through the season. And both times, he passes it up because he thinks it would help their cause if he sticks with it and serves his time. Episodes bleed into each other in other ways, too. Like this episode where Scott and Jean are fighting a group of deformed mutants in the sewers who want to f*** Cyclops because he's so manly. To serve my people, I need a companion. Someone to provide me an heir. And Wolverine's secretly in love with Jean. <laughs> yeah, that's that. It's that thing. You remember that thing? Everyone knows that thing. So seeing that her and Cyclops aren't breaking up anytime soon causes him to leave. This was back in the day before the love triangle was solved with adjoining bedrooms and slightly more open minds. So much insufferable pining could have been skipped in those movies. And that sets up the plot for the next episode. Now Wolverine's out on his own in Canada being hunted by Sabretooth. In the B-plot, the X-Men investigate an island resort that claims to be mutant-friendly. They go there and get forced into slavery by the same D-bags from the Sentinel factory using collars that disable their powers. And that plot ends on a cliffhanger while Wolverine finally comes to his senses and decides to go home. And that leads into the next episode, where he joins in the effort to free them. Most episodes do something to set up the next one immediately after, and every season has its own long story arc in the background of each story that leads to the season finale. Season 1 being Beast's battle against the corrupt justice system, Season 2 having Charles and Magneto stranded on a strange island without their powers, and, you know, seeing how the team has to manage without them, and Season 3 is all about the Phoenix Saga and so on. It may seem sort of paltry and common now, but having continuity like this between episodes for an animated show was pretty unheard of. Shows like Spectacular Spider-Man followed this model to tell some great stories, but the 90s X-Guys did it first. Most of the time, animated shows from this era would be a Villain of the Week show, with a single 22-minute one-off story that's easily digestible with no prior knowledge of the events going on. And everything in the status quo would be reset by the end of the episode every single time. You can watch any episode of He-Man or Transformers and pretty much know exactly what's going on. And it always wraps up in a nice bow at the end without really dragging out into anything longer, except for, like, multi-part episodes, but even those are just self-contained. But X-Men broke the mold by being serialized instead of episodic. And of course, being about more than your typical heroes versus villains stories among these action figure cartoons of the time. And even the movie series couldn't get as deep into the nitty gritty of this stuff because they were hampered by the two hour running time and two to four year gaps between sequels. The show could sit down and lower the stakes and develop everything more in depth and with more nuance. I've always thought that long running animated shows are much better for adapting comic stories than film because they have that room to breathe and no limitations of budget for their concepts. Much like Invincible these days, X-Men can tell some long and faithful adaptations of the source material without having to oversimplify or condense it all to fit. Sometimes the story needed to be told over the course of nine episodes, and that's fine. Often, the show faces the X-Men with problems they can't just punch to death, like political movements against them, media campaigns spreading false information about mutants, hate groups gaining public favor, scientists trying to cure mutants instead of helping them become more accepted, and so the show asks moral questions where the answer isn't always immediately clear. Was Cyclops wrong for leaving Morph and Beast behind, even if it saved the rest of the team and allowed them to fight another day? If a mutant like Rogue, who physically harms people by just touching them, had the ability to be cured, should she take it? Sometimes the questions get even bigger and more philosophical with dumbass time travelers Cable and Bishop. Bishop comes from the days of future past apocalypse and is going back to influence events from the 90s to stop mutant genocide. 
The cable is from an even further point in the future where it's the Apocalypse Apocalypse. And some of the stuff Bishop does to stop his apocalypse makes the distant future even worse. So we have this cool conflict of them both going back to the same moment in time to argue about the needs of the many versus the needs of the few. The time travel stuff is well utilized because they generally keep it simple. We get to see one version of the events influenced by Bishop where Apocalypse kills them all. Then we get to see the same 20 minute episode again with Cable getting involved and changing the ending slowly but surely throughout the story. Coming up with a way that he can protect both versions of the future. All these moral quandaries make the conflicts between characters really interesting and layered. Everyone's got a different idea of how to solve the problem, and this stuff's a little more heady than the usual we gotta stop the villain's doomsday weapon sort of cartoon plots that superheroes often face. X-Men doesn't hold the audience's hand. It knew that kids would be able to understand and ponder these topics. It doesn't hold back on its themes like the more watered-down 89 cartoon did. Some of this stuff still feels relevant today, mostly because, you know, nothing ever changes. Hey! You're one of those plague-carrying mutants! Plague-carriers? You won't infect anybody else! They were very clever about finding scenarios to slot mutants in as an allegory for multiple different minority groups that were struggling in America. From different races being treated unfairly, to foreign immigrants like Colossus trying to find work, to the working class struggling for livable wages, to this anti-mutant hate leader reacting to his dad being Sabretooth like it was a bigot discovering his father was gay. It's not as blunt of a metaphor as some of the movies in terms of handling LGBT themes. Have you tried... not being a mutant? In fact, they may not have even intended that as a reading. Maybe it was just meant to be the racism allegory by itself. But I still think it's a valid reading nonetheless. Yeah, this show is preachy SJW trash and it was awesome for it. Big whoop, wanna fight about it? But it's still very much the X-Men filtered through the political lens of the 90s. And as such, we also get a lot of comic book shit from the 90s too. Cable was a super new character at the time, so it was cool to see him get so much love in this show. Same goes for a lot of other Marvel characters that bump into the story from time to time. Like Miss Marvel, Captain America, Alpha Flight, Punisher a few times. And looky, there's a Deadpool! He doesn't appear directly, it's usually just in memories or shapeshifters trying to get Wolverine riled up with someone from his past. But it's damn cool to see him in there at all and know a version of him exists alongside this Spider-Man. Alright, webhead. I heard about what you said to Iceman. No one embarrasses the X-Men with their poor social skills but me. That's right, eventually we get a crossover episode with Spider-Man the Animated Series too. And a cameo in Dark Phoenix. Looking at their appearance in Spider-Man, I notice how distinct this show's animation style is. Even from adjacent Marvel cartoons on the same network at the same time. They have three-tone shading and heavy inking to really sell that comic book in motion look. Shading the characters this way makes every single frame of animation just that much more complicated to draw, and it takes so much more time. The show looking as slick as it does is a testament to the animator's skill keeping everyone consistent and on model with all these colors to put on. Compare this to a show with a smaller animation budget like Spider-Man, which settled at only two-tone shading. I appreciate the level of effort it took to get this show's visual style looking how it did, without going overboard like that Avengers cartoon that was a busy mess of colorful, airbrushed vomit. Let me get this straight, Poindexter. Your eyes are portals to a dimension full of lasers? Do you realize how stupid that sounds? You think my hands are portals to the stabbing dimension? How about I open a portal to the pain dimension? I can't stay mad at you, sweetheart. Come here. And a further contrast from Spider-Man, it wasn't as afraid of potential censorship and the fight scenes have some punching and violence. Nothing too crazy, but not toothless either. Plus, who doesn't love the intro for this show? Which one? I don't know, all three of them are great. Look at the ones from Japan, too. Man, anything feels more badass just listening to that song. Just play over doing the dishes, folding laundry, doing taxes. Don't take my analysis of this show the wrong way. It's a little more heady and serious than shows of its kind, but it's also silly, weird, and dumb fun, too. Cody, please, come with us. I bet the professor can find some way to help you. We see islands full of dinosaurs, giant robots, alien reality show hosts kidnapping the X-Men for an episode of the hottest show on intergalactic cable, 
cameos from Punisher, an episode about Rogue stealing Miss Marvel's brain on accident for like five years, time travelers busting in and messing up events left and right, and a Christmas special I reviewed a few years back. But as silly as all of this sounds, it's still in service of great stories and character arcs and never feels like it's dipping too far into ridiculousness for me. I love the way this show balances everything so it's not too dull and sad, but also not too silly and off the wall. But this show does really commit to story arcs for two, three, or even four part episodes. So if you're not into that story off the bat, you might be bored for a little while. It's a lot like real comic books in that way. God, I wish they'd just stop doing this event tie-in and get back to the actual thing I care about. Another thing I respect this show for is its restraint. A big turnoff for me getting into X-Men movies and comics is that there's like 3,000 characters and the roster changes at the drop of a hat like superhero musical chairs so you can never get too attached to like anything. But this show establishes its main roster in the first episode and then never changes it. Sure all of the other X-Men characters exist and appear like Colossus, Nightcrawler, Bishop, Iceman, but they're all minor appearances that hop in once in a while instead of permanently joining the team. Iceman was a member of the first class team and we get an episode about him with some flashbacks to the Kirby Lee era of the team and their old costumes. But now he's a solo act that the X-Men team up with for a one and done. He's uh, he's been busy hanging out with Spider-Man I guess. For a show like this, adding more and more characters with each passing episode would have been a great way to pump out more and more action figures to sell. But they showed restraint keeping the main cast tight and focusing mostly on them. For one, it helps us get more attached to this set of characters and learn more about them without getting overshadowed too quickly by new additions. I suppose the action figure sales were driven by the comics at the time because X-Men was huge in the 90s, so the show didn't feel as pressured to add more palette swapped Autobots and lame gimmicks. Man, f*** the aerial bots and Stunticons, they suck. Yeah, that's right, I said it, let's fight about it. Something I don't see people mention about this series often is that the art style changed in the final season. I suppose the budget was lowered as the show was getting a little long in the tooth and losing steam, so the characters were redesigned and taken down to only two-tone shading. Something about the redesigns makes this final season feel a little off. It's the same characters, but it's like not quite how I remember them. The final season is one of, if not the shortest, and feels like a fond farewell to the series. You could tell they were winding down because it doesn't have the long overarching plot, it's almost like an anthology of one-offs to say goodbye to the characters and see them doing stuff we haven't before. Like a flashback to Wolverine's time and the big one helping Captain America punch Nazis. Look at this show's obvious political agenda, yikes! And bizarrely enough, the show ends on an episode where Professor X is basically assassinated by an anti-mutant extremist on live television. He's in critical condition in the care of the team, and the attack on him creates mutant riots and uprisings all over the world, led by Magneto. Much like pretty much every time they fought him so far, Magneto's too tough for them, but he backs down when he realizes his old friend is dying. We then have a heartfelt goodbye from Charles, barely clinging to life, telling his team how proud they made him. Then he dies. But fear not, crying traumatized child in 1997. Lil Andra of the Shi'ar Empire and Professor X's cool space girlfriend that he's in a long distance relationship with arrives to say that she can extend his life on her homeworld, but only while he's with the Empire, meaning that they can keep him alive at the cost of never seeing him again. With a heavy heart, they say goodbye to Charles Xavier for the final time and he lets the X-Men know he will always be with them in spirit. That's a bummer to end on, Jesus man! I think I respect that they only slightly pulled their punch on that one by compromising that he's still technically alive, but he might as well have just died in this scene and I don't think it lessened the impact any. X-Men TAS never played around and it had a lot of faith in its audience. It was never afraid to grab a big meaty handful of uncomfortable subject matter and throw a wad of it straight at a denim jacket wearing child's face, because the 90s, and the show knew they could take it so it rarely held back. And that level of maturity and clarity of vision really set it apart from a lot of shows before it. Before Batman was a melancholy noir series skirting dark territory, before Spider-Man told the serialized day-to-day -day life and times of Peter Parker, before Gargoyles, before Spawn, there was X-Men breaking the mold by trying something a little different and risky. It's a product of its time, 
but it's also revolutionary in spite of that. It was a massive success both in ratings and critically when it came out because it was something so fresh and bold. But I think a lot of younger audiences aren't aware of that and think it might just be something like Pride of X-Men. So to hear people these days say they haven't watched it or their impression of it is that it's cheesy and dumbed down compared to later incarnations of the X-Men is a sad sight because they'd probably love it if they gave it a chance. Like I said, I didn't grow up with this show and I have no nostalgia for it at all. I didn't watch it until I was 19. But I find myself blown away by its strengths now that I've checked it out as an adult. It's absolutely worth your time because the series encapsulates everything X-Men is about and knows how to balance the fun spandex-wearing punchy adventures with ideas that apply to the real world around you, even today. This show is instrumental to bringing the X-Men into over 23 million households and paving the way for the 2000s feature film that sparked the beginning of the superhero renaissance in film. If you haven't seen it before, give it a chance. And if you have, well... Watch it again, I guess. Addendum! Just as I was finishing this video, Season 6 got confirmed, and they're just doing more episodes of this with all the original cast that are still alive. I messaged Cal Dodd right after I saw the announcement, and he's going to be the main Wolverine voice again after 25 years. So it looks like this video is kind of a warm-up for him. That's awesome. I hope in the new episodes they give Deadpool lines this time. All right, Xavier, where are you? I heard someone was keeping you in this dump, said Mr. Sinister. Uh, I think you have the wrong address, fella. The door wasn't even locked. Well, you look a lot shorter in person. Who are you? Xavier, but a different one. Instead, I sit in a chair all day watching 90s cartoons. Hey, would you mind reading this for me? Subscribe to Xavier for more videos like this one. Also, special thanks to the incredibly talented Cal Dodd for providing a voice for the old knucklehead in this video. And a big thank you to Jacob and Ben for editing this and Dane for his art. Hey, what is this? Some kind of dorky internet thing? Yeah, pretty much. Oh, also, do you want to hang out? Hmm. All right. You into Neon Genesis Evangelion? I'm really into that show right now. Man, you are from the 90s. In fact, I like a lot of Japanese stuff.